Welcome, everybody. It's great to see everybody here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Eros and Shelley back um, to CBMM and BCS. Um, Aero got uh, his start here, well, not his real start, but got his PhD here. Um, did his PhD with Ted Adelson as a student in ECS, right? Yeah. Uh, and um, everybody in the, the room um, is probably very familiar with um, his trajectory and his many contributions. Um, and he, he's, um, he's a really remarkable guy in my mind just be, because of the, the breadth of the contributions that he's made to so many different fields. Um, so his PhD did really pioneering work on visual motion processing, um, introducing the idea that you could do Bayesian analysis of visual motion, um, introducing the idea of a slow prior, um, but then ended up explaining like lots of different stuff and was one of the, the first kind of influential applications of um, Bayesian approaches to perception. Um, he's made lots of important contributions to image processing, so he's um, got this uh, method for measuring image similarity that like turned out to be like wildly incredibly popular um, that many of you may know. Uh, he's also made lots of contributions for visual neuroscience, modeling the responses of individual neurons, with lots of influential collaborations uh, with physiologists um, in particular. Um, lots of uh, important contributions to perception, so he's done massively influential work on crowding, um, probably most important paper in texture perception, many of you know, right? so it's really kind of a shockingly diverse portfolio. Um, he's been um, at NYU for most of his career, so was briefly at Penn, uh, straight out of grad school, uh, was, was then hired by Center for Neuroscience. I had the great pleasure of doing a postdoc in his lab, uh, which was a fantastic place full of, of smart and friendly people uh, right before I came here. And for the last couple years, he's been the director of the Flatiron Institute, uh, which is a new institute for computational neuroscience uh, that he started a couple years ago. So that's getting up and running um, and is a, a new chapter in, in things for him. And so I think what he's going to tell us about today um, is so, some work that uh, he's done since he moved there. Um, so uh, hopefully that did you justice. It was, I got told I was introducing him two minutes ago, so that was, that was um, my attempt to summarize the many contributions. So uh, welcome, Arrow. Thank you, and uh, look forward to your talk. Thanks, Jeff. Uh -huh. Thanks, Josh. Um, and thanks, Gabriel. Thanks for uh, inviting me. That was Josh's way of saying that um, I'm all over the map and I still haven't figured out what I want to study. I guess that's been like that since I was a graduate student. Um, and uh, I, let's, let's see, I was going to add one more thing. Uh, I'm actually not the director of the Flatiron Institute. That's the one thing you got wrong, Josh. I'm, I'm the director of a new center within the Flatiron Institute. The Flatiron Institute is a, uh, an internal research endeavor by the Simons Foundation uh, aimed at using computational methods and tools and, and ideas and theories uh, to advance science in different directions. It actually consists of five different centers, and I'm the director of the Center for Computational Neuroscience. Okay. Uh, enough said. So, um, so I'm going to tell you, tell you about stuff that's um, developed in my group over the last, it's really about four years um, when we succumbed to the deep net craze. We were resisting, but I'm told resistance is futile, and I think that's correct. We, we basically had to give up about four years ago, and we started thinking about what to do about this. And so I'll tell you basically some bits and pieces of the story of, of where we've gone on this and some things we've learned along the way. And um, the talk is not explicitly about biology, but there is some biology in it. Um, and you know, in, in the kind of work that I do is really sort of broadly conceptual. It's about vision, so I, that, that's really the theme. Um, so just to uh, emphasize that, so when you were looking at that picture of the cows, which for, I don't know why I always start my talks with a picture of the cows. It has nothing to do with the topic of my talk. I just love the photograph. Um, and uh, when you're looking at that, of course, the visual information is coming into your eyes. It's working its way through through your eyes, uh, through your uh, lateral geniculate nucleus, down, down your optic nerve to the LGN, back to the uh, cortex, and then it winds its way through your cortex, and, and sort of out of that emerges sight, whatever it is that you think you're looking at, your ability to interpret things, to, to recognize them, to uh, react to them emotionally, to understand their material properties, to understand where they are in, uh, in space and, and uh, three-dimensional space, et cetera. So, 
my group in general is interested in how uh, that happens. <clears throat> how do those neurons encode visual information? What is it that they're doing to represent that information? How does that allow or limit our perceptual capabilities? And, um, and how do we build engineered systems that can exploit that, maybe use some of the same principles, or maybe mesh with those, uh, those uh, biological uh, systems? And, and all of it really is built around a foundation of, of thinking about you know, what are the principles, what are the fundamentals of, of visual signals how do, and, 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 um, and their properties. And in fact, uh, for today's talk, uh, the core really, if I think all the way back to when I was a graduate student starting out with TED, I, worked, I did my master's thesis on wavelets, they will appear in this talk, um, and, and multi-scale representations. And, and the, I, a lot of what drove that work and continues to drive my thinking about vision is understanding prior probabilities. Understanding what, what is it that makes a visual image you know, different from white noise? What is it that um, characterizes the properties that we see in the visual world? How, do, how does our brain learn to understand those things? So your, your brain and, uh, and many artificial visual systems actually have priors uh, for, for the signals that they have to operate on. Sometimes those are quite explicit, sometimes they're implicit, sometimes they're built into the algorithmic structure. Of if we build some sort of an algorithm for processing images, we might build the priors into the algorithm. Uh, but, but usually they're there in some form or another. And you're, you know, for your visual system, you know that you have things like priors for images, because if I ask you to look at something like this and I say, well, which, which of these images was the, is the correct or true image and which ones are distorted, every one of you in the room can answer the question without, and, and you'll all get it right. Um, so how do you know? How does your brain know? How does your visual system know? What is it that you've learned through your lifetime? It probably doesn't take all that much experience to be able to answer this question. A young child could do it. Uh, what is it that you learned about images that tells you what they're supposed to look like and what they're not supposed to look like that allows you to answer that question? Um, okay. So there's a long history to building image priors, explicit image priors. It goes back to the sort of the, the beginning of, of era, the era of signal processing. Maybe that's like the 1940s or something. Um, and you know, this is my brief, in a nutshell, summary of that. And a lot of times, so because, because it's difficult to build a prior on a signal that lives in a high dimensional space, we all know that there's something that the statisticians tell us about called the curse of dimensionality, which more or less is the idea that you can't just make histograms. Uh, if you try to make histograms of things in high dimensional spaces, uh, you're never gonna fill up the bins uh, because the number of bins that you have goes up um, goes up uh, as, a, as a power, it's, it's exponential in the number of dimensions. So the curse of dimensionality says you're not gonna figure this out from data, and so the old approach to this was always, well, think about symmetry properties of the signal, think about the generation of the signal, the physical properties, think about, um, um, make various kinds of structural assumptions that, that make sense, and then come up with a very simple description, like a parametric description of what's going on. Um, so we have the, the tradition in the field started with Gaussian models, uh, of course, the sim sort of simplest parametric model we have for probability distributions, and there are various reasons why those things show up, and probably many of you know those. Um, it, it, and the, that model, which kind of takes off in the 50s, is the bedrock model, it's the thing you find still in most textbooks as a, as a description of, of natural signals, and in particular natural images. And, and that model leads to um, ab you know, our abilities to solve various problems. I'll, I'll walk you through in just a second an example, a quick example. Um, in the 90s, really sort of in the 80s, but it really starts to take off in the 90s, uh, there are these new observations that are made, which are that if you look at images locally, um, you find out that their distributions are very not Gaussian. Um, they're very sharply peaked, they have heavy tails, they don't look Gaussian at all. And so that is the beginning of a, of a new era of thinking about images and, and their properties. Also, natural sounds. Um, and we, we can think of that as the sparse model era. And usually those involve local filters, uh, like the things that you find in multi-scale decompositions, like the Laplacian pyramid or the wavelet decompositions. And, and, and the models are, are, depending on who you ask and how they like to describe them, they're either heavy-tailed probability distributions or they're things that involve um, you know, um, delta functions um, and uniform distributions uh, com combined. And the way that 
pans out when you actually think about what's going on in the space is that you, you transform your, your image in the high dimensional space into, you basically can do it with a, an orthogonal transform. So it's just a rotation of the space. And in that new space, most of the data lie along small groups of axes. That's the sparsity property. And what that turns into geometrically is that the, the model is sort of a, a, a union of subspaces that lie along collections, subsets of the axes. So you can think of, if you think in three dimensions of, a, of, a, of three axes, and you take the three planes, uh, the horizontal plane and this vertical plane and this vertical plane, you can think of most of the data being concentrated around those planes, not living in the ambient space, but concentrated around those planes. And that takes off then as a methodology and a con conceptualization of how to think about these signals, how to process them, how to solve problems, how to solve inverse problems or inference problems involving measurements of those signals. Okay, so that's the 90s and the 2000s. We kind of, a whole bunch of people, including my group, but many, many groups, uh, worked on trying to evolve those a little bit to say, well, actually, those, those things that describe these, these distributions as sparse or heavy-tailed, they're just describing marginal distributions. What you really want is to start looking at the joint action of these things, the, the interactions of these things in neighborhoods. And once you do that, you realize they're not independent, and you do actually need to start processing and describing what's going on in little, at least in little groups of them. And that leads to a whole set of models that, I, I don't know what to call them, but they're sort of joint sparse models or adaptive uh, sparse models that know how to find clusters or clumps of stuff that belong together. So that's the early 2000s. And uh, before I jump to the modern era and my nightmare with deep nets, um, I'll just finish a few, I'll say a few things about, about this, these models. So how do we test them? So the purpose of learning these priors is not just because I want a probability distribution, I kind of like them. It's not because I want to generate uh, pretty pictures, although that's what people often do with them. Um, in the brain, the purpose is presumably because you want to be able to fill in missing information. Or if you gather information under bad conditions, it's a rainy, stormy night, you're looking through you know, your car windshield, the windshield wipers are going like this, and you're trying to figure out what's out there, um, you're using an enormous amount of knowledge about how the world works and how images work in combination, combination with these measurements that you're making that are really crummy, and you're trying to fill in all the missing bits uh, so that you can make reasonable decisions. Um, you also, I mean, there's more basic things, like you have a blind spot in each retina uh, where there are no photoreceptors, so the, 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 the usual story is, that's told is that you somehow fill that information in. You have, to, you, you have a sense that you know what's there even though you are not making any measurements in that region of the image. How do you do that? Well, you have priors. You have an understanding of how images are supposed to behave. Okay, so, um, so how do we test them? So the simplest, you know, the simplest in, inverse problem we can solve is probably the denoising problem. And um, if you set it up using a prior, it looks kind of like this. It's, it's a problem in Bayesian inference or Bayesian estimation. So over here is an original image. I'll just use X for the original signal. Here's Y, the noisy observation. Um, and here's the denoised one. That's actually a denoised one that came from a deep net. So it's, it's pretty impressive. You can probably see already. Um, and, and how, do you, how do you formulate this problem? Well, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I know most of you have probably seen this. If you haven't, don't then uh, just try to catch the concept. I'm only going to show a tiny bit of math in this talk, so I'm not, you won't get buried in, in equations. It's just a few, a few examples of equations just to illustrate ideas. So um, this is a least squares, a formulation of a least squares or a, a minimum mean squared error estimator for the image. And we write that as x out of y. It's the thing that minimizes here the squared error between my, our estimate and the true thing. And we do that by computing the expectation. It's the expected squared error. We compute the expectation over the conditional distribution of the true thing given the noisy thing. That's the, the posterior distribution of, of the true image. Okay? And uh, so this is our loss function, the squared error. And, uh, and it turns out that when you want to minimize the squared error, you, you can calculate this directly. And this, the, the thing that minimizes the squared error is just the conditional mean. It's kind of like the thing that minimizes squared uh, variability. Uh, the, if you're taking the squared variability around some point, the, the best thing to choose is the mean. You want to pick the mean. So the mean um, is, is written this way. That's the expected value of x given y. And we can write that out using Bayes' rule like this. 
Okay, so what was the point of all of that? Uh, the point of that is that if there are three ingredients. There's the, the loss function, the squared error. There's the measurement model, which is P of Y given X. That's the noise distribution. And then there's the prior. Okay, so the three things come together, and we turn the crank, and we get our answer, and it looks like we have to calculate this big integral. Okay, so um, the, these ingredients will come back, which is why I'm uh, going through them at this point. Okay, so, so what happens in the, in the model from the 50s, the Gaussian spectral model? Well, that's pretty easy. What you do is you, you, you transform into, a four, into the Fourier space. You do a Fourier transform using these big sinusoidal basis functions. And then in that space, you multiply each one of these uh, frequency responses by a constant. The constant depends on the signal-to-noise ratio. The low frequencies have better signal-to-noise ratio. So those you basically keep. The high frequencies you throw away because they have lousy signal to noise ratio. You do a low pass filter. You throw away the high frequencies, keep the low frequencies. More or less, roughly speaking, you just kind of chop and keep some stuff. So this, you know, interestingly, um, this is a projection into a subspace. You're taking the full space and you're smashing it into the low frequencies, throwing away the high frequencies. And, um, and it doesn't work that well, but it is the classic thing and it is the thing in the, in the textbooks. Uh, what happens in the, in the, in the era of uh, the, the wavelets? I'm, I'm having trouble seeing my own slides. Sorry, I'm like leaning out here uh, with the angle. Um, what happens in the era of the sparse wavelet priors? Well, now what you do is you do a different transform. You do local, think of it as local Fourier transform. These are the sort of wavelet decompositions, little oriented filters. And, and in each of those, you notice that the coefficients have this sort of sparse behavior. And what you do is you say, if they're small, throw them away. But if they're large, I'm going to keep them. So, the, so now the function is not linear. It's, it's something like maybe like this. And what the function is doing is saying, keep only the large amplitude coefficients, throw away the small ones. So interestingly, again, this is a sort of projection onto a, onto a subspace. But now it's an adaptive projection. You're not saying, always go onto the low frequency space, throw away the high frequencies. You're saying, well, I'm going to be selective. I'm going to go through and look at all the coefficients. I'm going to pick the ones that are below some threshold. I'm going to throw those away. Those are getting projected out. But all the ones that are clear the, clearing the threshold, I'm going to keep them. So this is still projection onto a subspace, but now the subspace depends on the image. Okay, so that's, that's a sort of abstract concept for what's going on, uh, but it helps later with the intuition. So, um, and then, you know, Martin Wainwright and I came up with this joint uh, Gaussian scale mixture model. This is about the joint statistics of the wavelets. And, and again, you can, you can kind of look at these as, it's, it, the idea is basically that the dependence, that one of these things, the responses depend on its neighbors, and the dependencies uh, can be captured by just thinking about what the local amplitude looks like. So again, it's local, it's amplitude that's going to drive the decision. And again, we're going to do something like projecting onto a low dimensional space. And now it's joint. So this is a picture of the, of the actual calculation that, that comes out of this, uh, of using this for denoising that says that, uh, you know, if I have a noisy child coefficient and I also have its noisy parent, um, I should do something like throw away the small coefficients, but only if the parent is also small, right? So, that, so now it's, th th there's a dependency on, and you, of course, this generalizes to a whole neighborhood, as I sh showed you in that little cartoon. Okay, so, so all of these, so what's the point of all of this? The point of this is that we had a long history of uh, building, building methodologies for doing denoising based on priors, and in the end, they all come down to projections onto subspaces. They all come down to taking the data and smashing it onto some surface, which is an appropriate surface where the signal likes to live or is most likely to live, maybe is the right way to say it, um, and kind of clearing out the stuff that's, eh, it's, it's, it's buried in noise, it's too small, or maybe it's not likely to be there in any case. And so all of these methods are doing things like that. Um, so now along come the deep nets. Um, and, uh, and they change everything, and uh, we, we still don't know how they work, not really, but they did change everything. And, and it's inescapable, as I was saying in the beginning of my talk, right? I, I succumbed to this four years ago. I've been um, avoiding it, trying to pretend, eh, yeah, it's people just screwing around. It's not really going anywhere. It's another one of these waves. It'll be gone. Like a lot of things that show up in, in, in NeurIPS, it'll be gone in three years, and then we can ignore it uh, safely. No, but, but that didn't happen. So it's still here, and it seems to be getting bigger and better. Um, so the truth is that um, it is amazing. 
actually, what you can do with these simple networks. So this is a really dumb one here. Sorry, that's not meant to be offensive to the authors. They did the simplest thing they could do, which is just to stack up a bunch of convolutions, 64 channels per layer, 20 layers. Uh, I don't know how these numbers are arrived at, but this is what they did. Three by three filters, batch normalization, rectifiers, but it's just rectifiers. It's convolutions and rectifiers, 20 stages of it. Train the thing on denoising, how does that work? You get a big database of clean images, you add some noise to them, and then you train the thing. Basically, you train, train it using nonlinear regression to, to remove the noise, that's it. Um, and it has 700,000 parameters, that's all those filters that, that you have to learn. Um, and you train it on a big data set, the Berkeley data set in this case, and the performance is, is stunning. That, that's actually an example image. I'm not here to talk so much about the performance, but, but it is stunning. It's way better than any of those old things, way better. And so we set about trying to figure out how does this work? Like, how is this even possible? And nicely enough, um, after a, a bit of effort and a lot of missteps, we realized a couple of things. First of all, we found a way to take that network and make it universal. So we stripped out a bunch of things and simplified it even more. And it turned out that you could, um, you could just apply it. You could train it on very small amounts of noise and it would generalize to any amount of noise. That was a, a bit of a shock. So training it on basically almost invisible noise allowed it to handle even huge amounts of noise um, and without losing any performance. Um, and, and the other advantage to doing that, uh, to setting it up the way we did, is that it, it became more, um, more accessible in terms of understanding and analysis. So it turns out that when you analyze what this thing is doing in different regions of the space, it's doing, maybe it shouldn't have been a surprise, it's projecting onto subspaces, low dimensional subspaces. And it's extremely adaptive. So unlike the wavelet decomposition, where the projection was onto these subspaces that are aligned with the axes, I told you, you know, imagine the 3D case where you have the three planes, this thing knows how to find very complex structure, notice it in the noise, find the appropriate space and project onto it, wherever it is. The spaces all go through the origin, so if you imagine little slivers of, of, of planes that you're projecting onto, and they're all connected up because the whole thing is continuous, it's a cone. It's a generalized cone. So the, 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 sub, the underlying geometry of the structure of this is, can be approximately described as something that looks kind of like that, like a, little, like a flower almost. It's got undulations, it's rapidly varying, um, and it's very, very adaptive. So it's not something that we knew how to write down or how to express or how to learn uh, by hand in any way, but this is what this network seems to arrive at. Okay. So um, that's great, and now I want to do something with it. The thing knows how to denoise. We know how to train that with regression. Great. But now we're in this, um, pardon my, my, uh, my language, but we're in an ass-backwards situation. We started with the denoise. We were supposed to learn a prior and then go use it to solve different, different kinds of problems that we wanted to solve. To, to solve inverse problems, to solve inference problems. And now, somehow, we ended up on the wrong end of this. We solved with regression to get a denoiser. It does something spectacular, but we don't know how. And uh, with that, we didn't want a denoiser. Who wants to solve denoising? Especially Gaussian denoising. It's, it's a boring problem. Nobody cares. Except this thing knows what an image is supposed to look like. So the question is, how do you take that and yank out of it the implicit prior? And, and put it to use in other problems, in lots of other problems. And that's, that's what I'm gonna tell you about. Okay, so that's not a new idea. The idea of taking a denoiser and using it to solve other problems is not a new idea. And if you go back in the literature, you can find these things called plug and play methods that try to do an approximate version of this inside of an iterative scheme. Uh, there's these denoising score matching uh, methods that were kind of independently developed in the machine learning community. That, and you can see some names that look like machine learning names. Um, and they, so those are developed in parallel, um, often not aware of each other, certainly not citing each other. Um, so two parallel literatures developing you know, side by side. This is kind of the image processing and IEEE community, and this is the machine learning community, and there they are. They're both happily ignoring each other. And then along comes, uh, <laughs> as usual, uh, well, I would often, uh, so along comes Yasha Sol Dickstein, who has this kind of strange but interesting paper in 2015 about how you can think about diffusion in, 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 
in models and maybe thinking about trying to reverse that. He doesn't have any examples, he just suggests the idea. And that sort of takes off. People start noticing that. And so when we um, started our work, which was in 2020, 2019, we started working on this, and trying to put this together, we noticed there were a couple of papers that were really interesting for us, and we tried to piece together what was going on there with, the, with what we had already learned about this denoiser. And so what the, the story that we arrived at, I'm, I'm going to actually run through the derivation. So I'm going, to sh I'm going to drag you through the math because it's so simple and it's kind of shocking, I think. If you take that mean squared error denoiser, the thing that minimizes the squared error, it computes the conditional mean, right? The expected value of x given y. There's the expression. Um, and it turns out, and so what is that thing? Well, if, it's, if you've got Gaussian noise, the distribution of the noisy, or distri the noisy um, data, P of y, is just a blurred version of the prior. So here's the prior P of x. This is an integral. It's integrating against a Gaussian. So this is a Gaussian blur of the prior. It's just a fuzzy version of the prior. OK. So now um, we can do a, just a little bit of math. It's basically algebra um, by taking the gradient of this and then dividing it by itself and multiplying by sigma squared, we get this funny look at expression, which is that this thing, which you can calculate off of this blurred prior, is the estimator minus the, the noisy observation. Or rewriting it, it looks like this. So the estimator, which remember was supposed to look like an integral over this gigantic space, um, can be rewritten as something which is a step, a gradient step. This is strange. It's, it's the, that's an integral, this is a derivative. What? And this thing is not an approximation. This is exact. This thing is exactly equal to that thing. And this thing is much more convenient, actually. So where does this come from? So my, when my student discovered this, I told him he was crazy. He wrote it on the board. This is something we did in 2010. He wrote it on the board. I said, it can't be right. He said it is right. He re-derived it. He was a math student, so I should have believed him, but I didn't. And he wrote it again, and I said, all right, this is really strange. And we went over this again and again and found different ways to write it and eventually generalized it to a large class of measurement models, not just Gaussian noise. But the Gaussian noise one is particularly interesting. And then it turns out that um, this is known in some very old statistics literature from the 60s, known as the empirical Bayes approach to um, basically to describing a number of different problems in statistics. So you can, Miyasawa is the main reference that we, we usually cite. This is a guy who in 1961 de derives this and, and just derives it and says, look at this. Um, what he didn't realize is that this would be important for machine learning. And there are related things that came from Stein, Charles Stein, and other statisticians that are also, I think, highly relevant to the current machine learning revolution, but are largely forgotten. These are in dusty old journals in the library. They're, they're often not scanned, not in electronic form. And they're a peculiar little corner of the statistics world. So anyway, we discovered them and tried to resurrect them, but we were not statisticians, so nobody paid any attention. Um, but so, so the bottom line is, this is a, this is a very strange uh, rewriting of this in terms of gradient. And um, oh, I already said some of these things, but this is not an approximation. It's exactly equivalent. It looks like gradient descent, but this is not iterative. This is one st you take one step, and you're there. That's the answer. Okay? And the last thing is that the prior, the answer to my question, how am I going to get the prior out of that network, is this last point. The prior is sort of in there. Now, instead of being embedded in this giant integral, there's p of x, it's kind of in here. This is a blurred version of the prior, and it's in there in that network somehow. That network knows how to compute this, right? I've, I've trained it, and it's really good at computing this. OK, so now we want to put it to work. Um, so here's a picture just to illustrate what's going on. Imagine that your prior is that you have a signal that lies on some curvy manifold in a two-dimensional space. That's the green thing. So you're drawing points randomly from that curvy thing. And your job is to sort of figure out, well, how do I, if I make a noisy observation, how would I push it back onto that curvy thing? If that was a plane or a line, it would be easy. You would do a projection. But it's not. It's this weird curvy thing. So. Um, this expression, which is the least squares estimator, which you can train on data drawn from that green curve, um, does this. So each of these red points are samples of noisy things. 
Um, the, the line shows you what happens when you compute that. And the fuzzy gray thing underneath is the blurred prior. So if you take that green thing, which lies only on that little curved uh, thing, and you blur it, you get the gray thing. So here, with a lot of noise, uh, this is what it would look like in an image, um, you, it's very blurred, and the steps you're taking are up the gradient of that very blurred thing. Here it's less blurred with less noise, here it's less blurred with less noise. So each of these, the steps are smaller, and you get closer and closer to going back to the green manifold. So in this case, these little, you, can, you can't really see it, the lighting is a little too high, but these, these things are almost landing on that green manifold, whereas here they're landing all over the place. You can see a bunch here that are landing somewhere in the middle. Thank you. Um, oh, speak, and it happens. <laughs> this is pretty good. What else can I get, get you guys to do back there? Um, okay, so, so, you see, so you see these things are not even close to the manifold in many cases, whereas these are almost landing on it almost all the time, or very close. Okay, so we can use that idea to do basically coarse to fine gradient ascent. That's the idea. Start out far from the manifold, very blurry, and start taking some steps. And as you get closer, I, I didn't tell you this, but the denoiser that we built is universal and, um, and blind. It doesn't know how much noise has been adding to the, added to the image. You just hand it the image and it'll clean it up. So you can hand it a very noisy image, it works. You hand it a tiny, a slightly noisy image, it works. It doesn't, it, it just knows. It doesn't have any auxiliary information, no side information, no lines. It's not multiple networks, it's one network, it does the whole thing. So that thing knows how to figure out how close it is to the manifold. The network knows where am I, and which way do I want to go, and how far do I need to go to get to that manifold. And so you can just allow it to control step sizes and to work its way along some path until it converges. And um, shockingly, yeah? Does the sample size, the training sample size, affect yes. something about what you just said? Yes, the training, the training, you need a pretty big sample set, but not as big as you thought, because, because well, we used to think cursive dimensionality meant that it would have to be absolutely enormous, but you could train these things on pretty decent sized images and it works. So I'm gonna say more about that in a little bit, but for now, a pretty big data set, but you know, something doable in today's world. Maybe it wasn't doable 25 years ago. Okay, so this is the algorithm. It, it is, I'm sorry for the algorithmic uh, layout. This is apparently what everybody expects these days. But basically, this thing is the denoiser minus the original, the noisy image. So this is something we can compute from the network. And all we're going to do is take little steps. They're right here. The Ys are getting, each Y gets, uh, you start out with your initial uh, noisy, uh, very, uh, just basically a sample of noise. And you take these little tiny steps that are fractions of this thing um, until you converge. That's it. And so just to illustrate how it looks, um, here's a video. That's a trajectory. As we get closer and closer, the, the, the network is estimating that there's less and less noise, and so that blurred thing is getting, it's getting less and less blurred until you land on, on the um, underlying manifold. And so here's a picture of a whole bunch of them. The, the video is, is just showing you individual trajectories, but here's a whole bunch of them. You can see they're curved. They always land on the manifold. They land all over the manifold, even in, the, in these little crevices. They manage to work their way into little crevices and take little, little turns to land right on this thing. Okay. Oh, it was really fun. I'll send you the MATLAB code. Okay. Okay. So it works. Um, so these are fairly small images. These are, I think, 50 by 50 uh, that are generated from this process. And this thing is trained on natural images. So it generates things that look like little chunks of natural images. They have features. They have edges. They have sharp things. They have, uh, sometimes they have textures. They have corners and junctions. Uh, they don't look like noise. They look like they could be snippets out of, it, out of natural images. Um, if you, sorry, yeah. Early on, you showed us the equation. You said this is just one step. It's not iterative. And then now we're doing. And now it's process. iterative. Yeah. I know. Yes. <laughs> uh, sorry, I slipped that by you. You weren't supposed to notice. Um, this Bill was my office mate when I was a graduate student, so he knows everything, and notices everything. Okay, so. Um, what I said was correct. The, the, the original form is, is a one-shot deal. That is the least squares denoiser. If, the, if you're going onto a surface that's curved and you have a noisy version, 
then the expected value, the mean of the posterior, is not going to lie on the surface. It's going to be you know, the average of a bunch of possibilities that lie along the curve, and it'll be somewhere inside the curve. So what you want to do is take very small steps, fractions of the, of the recommended step, because you're not trying to do least squares denoising. You're using the least squares denoiser, but really what you want is to use that gradient that it has. So the, so the trick is to say, okay, I trained, this is why everything is, as I said, ass backwards. You started by training the denoiser, it knows how to compute the gradient, but it's taking these big steps to land right on the least square solution, which is not what we want. So what you do instead is take little tiny steps in the direction of that gradient, and since the denoiser de de is universal, you keep recomputing it, and each time you recompute it, it's getting a different, a slightly different direction and a different step size. So it not only chooses a good path, as I was showing you with those curved trajectories, but it's reducing the step sizes as it gets closer in an appropriate way. So it, it controls the step sizes for the entire iteration. It's not, there's no schedule, there's no magic set of parameters that we're choosing to, get the, to set the step size. It really is a dead simple algorithm where it just controls its own steps the whole way through. Okay, does that help? Okay. All right. So if you train it on digits, like the MNIST, uh, then it generates things that look like digits. If you train it on faces, it generates faces. These are tiny faces, little, little. Um, I think they're something, these are something like 32 by 32, or maybe 40 by 40 faces. Okay, so, and, and most of you know, I mean, I, I'm, I work in a lab where, we have, where we're using small computers and small data sets and just trying to understand how these things work. But out there in the real world, um, this is happening, so, so in the in you know, basically what we started looking at in terms of these processes turned into what's now known as diffusion modeling, and people started generating fantastic images, very high quality and quite a bit larger. So these are all larger than the things I was showing you, and um, and you know it's completely exploded. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Question to piggyback on what Bill said. So I don't, I still don't totally get how this actually works. So you, you've got the denoising network, which takes an image in and outputs an image, right? Yes. So, so take the difference. Corresponds to this little step that you're doing. Got it. So take the difference. It, it went by quickly. Take the difference between the output image of the denoiser and the input image of the denoiser. I.e., what did it do? What step did it take? It's those little red lines in my plots, right? That's what I want. Yeah, what That's you, the gradient. And what do you, uh, you add that thing? That thing is the gradient. That thing is sigma squared times the gradient of the log of P of Y, the blurred prior. That's what that vector is. Okay, so that, so you have and I know how to compute that anywhere so in the space. So you have one noisy image and yes. one denoised output. Yeah. You get this one delta. Yeah. And then you add that to the noise sample here? Yes. But, then, but you add only a little bit of it, like the, the exact amount. Okay, so that's one step. 10, what's, 1%. The next, what's the next iteration for, for this? Compute it again. You've just moved a little bit. You're now in a different part of the space. You've made a little step. Change the image a little bit. Compute it again. Run it through the denoiser again. I see. So you, so, it gives so back that, a new, a noise, new gradient. That noise sample is what you're adding to the original image to noise it up. Just, just as an initialization, start with a very noise, just a pure noise image. That's a starting point. Start in a random place in the space. Take a step, a little step. Recompute. Take another step. Recompute. Take another step. Recompute. Take another step. Each time you have to re call the denoiser again. Well, when you're recomputing, what's the input on step two to the denoiser? The output from the previous step. I'm, I'm, I'm starting yeah, with an image, and then I'm adjusting it a little bit. Call the denoiser again. Take another step, this time in the, in the new direction that the denoiser told me to go. Do it again. That's it. You can inject, I, sh I didn't say this, I'm skipping past some things. You can inject noise in this process and create things that have a little bit more entropy. And you can inject the noise in a controlled way to, so that it doesn't overwhelm the gradient that you've computed, so that it's not bigger than the gradient you're inject, your, your step. And you can also build things that converge using that algorithm. So it's a very simple algorithm also, just a little bit of randomness injected. A little stochasticity. Okay. All right, so those are examples. Those are examples. 
Um, now, what we really want to do is not make pretty pictures. I told you that before. I want to solve inverse problems. So I want to figure out how do I take this thing and combine it with some measurement constraint uh, and, solve, and solve for an image that satisfies the measurement constraints and is a good image, a good natural image drawn from this prior. And it turns out that you can modify this algorithm to do that. And the critical piece is right here in the middle. It's basically saying, I don't know if m most of you can, can grok this, but um, this, is, this is the denoiser step. And we're multiplying it by something that's um, projecting out the measurement. And this is the part that the measurement is telling us. So the measurement is a linear measurement in the cases I'm going to look at. I, make, I take my original image, I make a measure, some measurement. I measure some things. I'm going to show you five examples of this. So if you're not getting the abstraction, you'll see some examples that'll tell you at least how the, what the idea is. Okay, so I'm going to make some measurements. I'm going to hold on to those measurements. And now I'm going to um, enforce the measurements gradually in concert with using the gradient that came from the denoiser in the orthogonal space. So I'm using the denoiser to fix the stuff that I don't know. And I'm using the constraint to fix the stuff that I do know. Right? So it's just two pieces partitioned, and I'm combining them. OK, so how does it look? I mean, this is the picture that you should have in your head from this little abstract diagram. There's a blue line here, which I guess you can't see. But that's the constraint. So let's say I make a one-dimensional measurement. It tells me that I want an answer that lies on that blue line. But I also want something that's drawn from this prior, the green wiggle. So I want things that are the intersection of the blue line and the green wiggle. And when I start from random starting points and I follow this procedure, I land up in these intersections. Okay, so that's that's the basic idea. Okay, so let's let's use it for a, for an image processing problem. So here's an example of a linear measurement um, filling in this hole. So the linear measurement is think of it as a giant matrix with ones on the diagonal for all these pixels that I'm keeping and zeros for all the ones that I'm throwing away. Right, so all the middle ones are thrown away. And here's three examples because this is stochastic. I'm starting from a random starting point. Here's three examples of how it takes that takes that and fills in the missing bits, okay? And here's the one that was trained on digits. If you do this and erase the top of this seven, it'll hand you back these three things, for example, um, which are obviously different digits, but how would it know if you've erased the top of the seven? So the point is that it does something quite reasonable in matching things up and producing something that fits with the, with the measurement. Um, here's a bunch of examples on more complicated images, and you can see that it actually works pretty well in all these cases. At the top is the original, the middle is the missing square, the bottom is what was reconstructed using this algorithm. So, it, and it's worth pointing out, this is the same denoising. All the examples I'm about to show you, I'm going to do five of these quickly. Um, it's all the same denoising network. We didn't retrain it for each of these applications. It's one denoising network. It was trained once on a big database, we put it aside. That's our engine, our prior engine, and we're just reusing it to solve these different problems, right? That was the whole, the whole point of the Bayesian paradigm is you get to separate out the ingredients and reuse them as appropriate, right? You don't have to train a new network to solve this problem, a new network to solve that problem, a new work, right? Each, each problem we're using the same prior, the same denoiser. Okay, so this is another one, dropping, dropping pixels randomly. So we drop ten, we only keep 10% of the pixels, we drop 90%, recover the images. It actually works, you know, I think, sh kind of shockingly well. It manages to get out things like texture, which you would think you would never be able to get out from that sparse sampling, but it manages to figure out where the fur needs to go and even where the whiskers need to go, just from this very small amount of information that's in these random samples. Um, this one, um, Bill will recognize. <laughs> um, I won't say any more. Uh, here are the original images. Here are the low resolution. These are four by four block averaged. Okay, so that's another linear measurement. I'm measuring the average of each block of pixels on non-overlapping blocks. Those are linear measurements. I can solve that problem. I go ahead and I solve it. This is, these are two other things that are published that use deep nets, actually. The Yulianov paper from 2020 and the Mateev paper from 2019. And I think you can see, I hope you can see even, even with the current lighting, that um, this is much sharper and much crisper as a re representation of these images. And in fact, even in this case, which I always like, um, where you see really heavy aliasing, so you see the sort of, these are dia sort of thin diagonal lines that, have, that end up with these sort of jagged uh, aliasing structures that show up when you, when you block average them. Um, these two methods both sort of end up replicating the, jagged, the jaggedness 
And this actually does a pretty good job of giving you back something that's, that's reasonably continuous and, and straight. Okay, so it, it's, I, I, to me this is shocking how, how well the prior works um, in this context. Again, this is the same, apart from, oh, sorry, we have two denoisers here. One of them was trained on color images and one was trained on black and white and grayscale images. So I, I slightly cheated when I told you it's the same denoiser. It's two denoisers, but they're trained you know, the same way. And, we're, and so all the color examples are coming from the color one and the, black, the grayscale ones are coming from the grayscale one. So this is the last one, this is compressive sensing. You project onto random basis functions. Again, 10% the number of the pixels. This is a, um, a published result that uses a deep net that's trained on a particular set of random measurements. Ours works on any random measurements. It doesn't need any extra training. You just fire away and do it. And I, and I think, again, the results are, I think, impressive. Okay, um, somebody told me I need to have tables of numbers, so we made some tables of numbers. It actually comes out really well in the tables of numbers. It's both fast and high quality. I mentioned this earlier. If you run just the straight version on the spatial super resolution, it's slightly worse than some of these other algorithms. But if you then average over 10 samples, it's better. Again, because the mean squared error, if you want to minimize mean squared error, you want the average of the posterior. And so ours is more or less giving you samples of the posterior. If you average over them, you'll make the mean squared error better, but the results will be worse. They, they will be visually worse. They're a little bit blurred. Okay, so it runs really fast. Sorry, so you're confused. You know, you took these small steps to avoid taking the, the I know. mean of your cluster, and now you're taking the mean of your cluster. Um, only to give good numbers for the table. <laughs> I'm serious. T Ted, Ted's smiling because he, he hounded me mercilessly when I was working on my master's thesis, because every, every time we were doing uh, denoising, Ted would always say they were too blurry. And I would say, but those are the optimal answers. I can't do anything about it. And Ted would say, well, you should sharpen it a little. And I'd say, you can't do that. That's the optimal solution. I can't touch it. And, um, and the answer, of course, Ted was right. Um, it only took me like 30 years to realize it. Um, it's, it, the, the answer is, uh, it's what I said, right? So if you want something that looks like a natural image, you want something from that manifold, that, that cone-shaped manifold. And so you really want to get a sample from the manifold, um, even if it's going to be, on average, a little bit worse in terms of squared error. If you wanted to minimize squared error, if that's your goal, then you need to average over those, and you'll get something that's a little bit blurry. But so why do you bother doing the diffusion thing? You know, why, why not do it in one step, then? You can't. How do you project onto a curved surface that, that you haven't even defined? That's, see, that's the thing. This is, uh, it's, it's ass backwards, I told you. <laughs> You're starting with a denoiser. It's designed to go to the mean. That sounds like a, not a useful thing, except that you rewrite it and you say, oh, it's going to the mean by taking a step in the direction of this gradient. I want the gradient. I don't want the mean. I want the gradient. And that's what we're doing. We're, we're grabbing that gradient and taking these little steps. I know it's, it's actually, each, each piece of this is simple, but it's kind of hard to assemble the whole sequence and make sense of it because it's so weird. I, I, the formula was weird. Okay, so there's two more tables of numbers. Ours works really well. That, what else can I say? That's what, isn't that what you're supposed to say with tables of numbers? Works really well. Okay. Um, here, you can do some nonlinear things, and we've been looking into examples of this, and there are more in process. But, you know, this is quantization. So if I do a three-bit quantization, so I take this thing and quantize it to eight levels of gray, you can see um, lots of contouring and, and funny-looking artifacts. You can recover from this, because this, it's not a linear measurement, but it's a measurement that's it's not hard to com combine a gradient with these sort of constraints that are about things that live in boxes. That's what quantization is. Uh, you just alternate between projecting into the box and, and taking a, a gradient step. And you can get results like this that look pretty good. We don't have, I don't have any tables of numbers for these. Okay, let me show you two quick biological examples. Um, well, let me, let me show you. Let me show you one quick biological example because I'm gonna. I feel like I'm gonna run out of time here, and I don't. I want to get to the last, the last little chunk. So let me show you one biological example. Here we go. So I'll do this one. 
um, we wanted to do a really difficult nonlinear inverse problem, and we wanted it to be more biological. So I have a colleague at Stanford that I work with for many years. I collaborate with E.J. Chitilinski. He records from retinas in a dish. He records from ganglion cells, the spike trains of those ganglion cells, and he can expose them to light by you know, focusing it through an imaging objective and, and shining patterns of light on the retina that's been taken out of a macaque monkey. Okay, so this is an example. So that's the, the chip that he uses. It's got 500 electrodes. He presses the, elect the, the, the retina into that little central dish against the electrodes. And after he's done the recordings and analyzed the responses, he can actually separate out the cells into, into different types. And he gets these fantastic mosaics that cover the back of, the, of, of your eye uh, with their receptive fields. And um, in particular, here are the major four major cell types that are in your, uh, your retinal ganglion cells that, that form your optic nerve. So these are the things that send the message. Everything you see comes out of the responses of these cells, these and another 16 or so types. These are the four major ones. Okay, so these, these are the cells that are basically gathering visual information and sending it down your optic nerve. Um, so what we wanted to do is to, is to ask the question, well, if we have this nice prior, can we recover um, information from the spike trains of these cells? What's happening here? There we go. Um, so, so to do that, uh, we, want, we have a prior and we need a likelihood function. We've got spike trains, but we need something that describes the relationship between the image and the spike trains. So for that, we turned back to some old work that we did, that Jonathan Pillow did in my lab, using something called a, GN, a GLM, or a recursive LNP model. So this is a model that we can use to fit those ganglion cells. It's got a receptive field up front, a stimulus filter, linear. It's got an exponential nonlinearity. It then generates spikes according to the rate that is specified by the output of that nonlinearity. And then it feeds the spikes back through a, a filter back into a summing junction that then gets injected back into the cell. And the idea is that these, these cells have state. They have, um, once they fire a spike, they've got, one thing is that they've got a refractory period, so they won't fire another spike for, um, for a millisecond or two. Uh, but they also have these rebound effects. So once they fire a spike, after a little bit of time, they're more, a little more likely to fire a spike. And you see these, so you can fit this model. The amazing thing about this model is not only that it explains the data pretty well, but that you can fit it to the data. Uh, it's a convex um, optimization problem to fit this to data. And you can get those filters, the, the stimulus filter and the post-spike filter, in such a way that they really do capture the details of the spike timing. So that's going to be our likelihood model. In fact, we'll make it even more complicated. We have one that has cross-coupling between the cells. So you've got that big population of cells. It's a couple hundred cells. And we have them connected up to their nearest neighbors using additional filters. That entire thing can be fit to the data. So we take a, 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 a data set from the retina. We fit this model to the data set. We now have a description of how images turn into, get turned into spikes. And now what we want to do is, if I'm at the, other, the receiving end of those spikes, I'm in the brain somewhere, well, the, the lateral geniculate nucleus, and I'm receiving those spikes, what do I know about the image that landed on the retina? And so what we're going to do is we're going to reconstruct that image by combining the likelihood, the description, the probability of spikes given the image. We're going to combine that with our prior, which we have implicitly in a denoiser, and we're going to smash those two things together and get an answer. The cool thing here is that um, you could also say, well, why don't you just train a deep net to decode the spikes? That would be more direct. Yes, it would be more direct. But you would need a lot of data, you need a lot of spikes, and a lot of images to do that. EJ can only hold these things for a day or two, so we're not going to, and he's got lots of other experiments he wants to run, so we don't have a lot of spikes and a lot of images. We have a relatively small number of those. We have, in fact, enough to fit this model, which is a relatively simple model, but we don't need to fit the prior to any of this. The prior, we go off and we fit that to a big pile of images from the Berkeley data set or whatever, right? So we don't, so these things are fit separately, separate components, and we smash them together only when we want to solve the inference problem. And so these are just to give you an, an idea of what this could do. Uh, these are examples. So on the left is the actual ground truth image that was shown to the retina. And the next column is what you get out of a linear reconstruction. This is what we get out of, I should have simplified these names, sorry. This is our method. Um, this is what you get if you use, if you replace that GLM model with a simpler linear, basically linear model. 
So simplify the likelihood, and this is what you get if you replace the prior, the, this, the one that comes from the denoiser, with a one over f spectral model. So, so the prior matters a lot. Um, the, um, the LNP versus GLM model matters not quite as much, but still a fair amount. You can see that a lot of detail is lost, for example, in this cricket, and you go from here to here. Um, and you can see that we're recovering, of course, these images are, are not, you know, they're, they're, there's information lost, but we can get a lot more out of them by paying attention to the spike trains and the details of the spike trains as modeled by that model, the GLM model. Okay. One last chunk I want to tell you about. So this is, so we're, we're continuing to work on uh, developing inverse problems. We're working, some of you are probably wondering about texture, since I've done a lot of work on texture modeling. We're working on thinking about how to incorporate these into texture models. And if I had that to show you, I, I would love to, but I don't. So I, I want to show you one more thing. This is a, a presentation that was um, at ICLR last week. And I'm just going to show you the, the highlights of that. But um, um, it's to resolve this issue. So we went back and we were trying to think what's going on. How, do, how are these things, how are these things representing prior information? And we discovered that um, in order to do things like that with big images, you need really big networks. So most of these things are using networks with hundreds of millions or even billions of parameters in order to capture and, and generate things like that. And it seems that every time you make the images bigger, you have to make the networks that much bigger, right? So they're, they're scaling pretty badly. It's not quite the cursive dimensionality, it's not exponential, but they have to be really huge. So we started digging into trying to figure out what's going on. So we can generate faces out of a small model like this, but they're small faces. And if we take that small model and we train it to denoise bigger images, the same size model, um, and when I say same size, it's, it's the same network and the same architecture, but the critical thing is what's called the receptive field. So each output pixel is you can trace back through the gradients and ask, well, or through the network, the architecture of the network, and ask which pixels in the input are being used to compute that output pixel. And here it's global. The whole image is being used to compute every output pixel. But here it's local. This, this pixel came from that box, right? The content of that box. And when you run this on the synthesis procedure, it doesn't work. You get, you get textures, you get bits of like face-like tissue pasted together. Uh, it does not generate faces. So it's lost. So, you know, if you want to be technical about it, this is basically a Markov model. It's capturing local structure in overlapping neighborhoods. And iterating that Markov model to generate samples does not give you things that capture the global structure. So, 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 the, so the lesson is that if you want to capture the global structure, you need things with global receptive fields. But we don't want to make bigger and bigger models, so what do we do? Let's make the image smaller. And of course, this is going to go back to the same multi-scale and wavelet and pyramid style tricks that I learned from Ted when I was a master's student. Um, so here's an image, make the image smaller. Of course, when you make it small, like blur and downsample, and when you do that, you lose a lot of information. So put the information back. Um, in fact, let's make an orthogonal transformation. This is W is a matrix. It takes this thing, transforms it to that. And what is that? Well, that's just four channels in a deep net, if you like. Um, four channels where there's a low frequency channel and three others that have the vertical, horizontal, and diagonal information. All together, these are equivalent. In fact, this is an invertible orthogonal transformation. And so the probability distribution, anything that you can write for probabilities on this can be re-expressed as a joint probability over these. And of course, now we want to write them conditionally because so far we didn't do anything yet. We're just rewriting using, using probability and now Bayes rule. So I'm going to rewrite them as a, a distribution on this low, low pass guy, this low resolution version of the image, and conditional distribution of these three conditioned on that. Okay. And now there's one more piece, which is we're going to assume, this is where the assumption, so far there was no assumption, but now there's an assumption. I'm going to assume that this piece can be made local. That is, it does not need to be global. It's a tiny model. And this one has to be global, because it has to capture the global structure of the face. And, um, and of course, this may still be a kind of a big image, so in order to do this um, more effectively, we can telescope it and make essentially a pyramid or if you like a wavelet decomposition of this image. And we can re repeat this and we write it out probabilistically. The, the overall distribution of this image on the left is just a product over each of these things 
these, it's, it's the little guy at the top, that's global, that's this one right here, little gal at the top, sorry. Um, and then these four are combined with this conditional local thing to give you this one. And then you do the same thing, do the same thing, and that gives you the whole thing, okay? So this is a, a very simple structure with one assumption, which is that these can be done locally, okay? So we implement the locality of those by making Again, a deep net, but this is a conditional deep net. It takes a little side input of this low frequency thing with these noisy things, and it figures out how to denoise those, okay? So that's a conditional denoiser. We put that all together in an architecture like this, which basically does conditional denoising, and at the very top, it does global denoising, um, and it works. Um, and the question then is, well, how local can we make it? We, the, the key thing is we're assuming it's local, and this is only going to be a win if we can make it really local. We don't want global representations because they require really big networks. Even worse, the network has to keep getting bigger as they make the image bigger. So what we want is something where we can keep using local networks no matter how big the image is. And this works uh, quite well. So this is, uh, this is um, denoising results as you make the receptive fields, the size of the network, smaller and smaller, and the top curve is, is a 43 by 43 receptive field, and as you drop the size of the receptive field, the performance starts to drop. This is, these are all plots of the input noise versus the output noise. You can see they drop, and they drop quite substantially. There's a log plot, this is PSNR. When you do it multi-scale, um, there's basically no drop. So the performance is completely preserved um, all the way through this until the very end. And, and, it's, and that's how it works out when you look at the results. So here, just to show that to you visually, here's a very noisy image, 7 dB on the input, and here are the three results that you get from these three different size networks if you just apply them in the image domain, and here's what you get if you do the multi-scale thing. Okay? So it basically is very stable and consistent down to very small sizes of networks. So we can make much smaller networks um, to handle any size image by doing this conditioning trick. Okay, and, and just to show you that it works, so you, now this I showed you before, it didn't work if you tried to use a small network to generate a big image, and now it does. Now we can generate faces with a little tiny network, a, little, a sequence of little tiny networks and a little one that captures that. Okay, that's it, that's all I was gonna say. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm slightly over time. Um, and, well, I'm actually under time for, in terms of my clock on my computer, but I'm over time in terms of the wall. So um, the old method was to build a density model and then use it to solve inference problems, and we did that by basically integrating Bayesian. Uh, the new method is you train a denoiser, like with tons of data, and now you solve inference problems by doing what I'm calling empirical Bayes ascent. I'm just gonna do gradient descent using the denoiser. And so we're working on lots of things to sort of expand and generalize this, including thinking about how, how this might be relevant in, implementation in, in biological systems that need to learn priors. Uh, I don't have an answer for that yet, but we are thinking about it and working on it. I have one student who's working on that project. And I want to thank um, all my co-authors that worked on this. A lot of the work that I told you about was done by Zara Kodkodai. Um, Florentine and Stefan have uh, recently joined in. All the multi-scale stuff was done with them, so there's a joint project with Stefan Malat. Um, and, uh, the, and I didn't show you the stuff that I did with uh, Ling Chi and David, but I showed you this. Eric Wu and, and EJ Chichilniski did the retinal work. Okay, thanks.